and welcome to Comics Crash Course. In our last video, we discussed the early grades of the newspaper comic strip, but we only focused on the funnies. In this video, we'll look at two ways the newspaper comics evolved in the late 1920s and early 30s. On the one hand, new genres are introduced to the comics, particularly the adventure strip. And on the other, a demand for reprinted material led to the creation of the comic book. So let's start in the newspapers themselves. Now, gag strips often featured elements of other genres. Romantic subplots, adventure bits, but they're always primarily about delivering a punchline, whether or not you find it funny. It only makes sense that as more and more strips got created, artists began to try and stretch the boundaries and try new and different things to stray further and further from accepted formulas. Perhaps the clearest transitional fossil between gag strips and the adventure strip is a series called Wash Tubs. Created by Roy Crane in April 1924, the series was a gag-a-day strip about a bumbling shop owner named Wash Tubbs. About 12 weeks after its debut, Tubbs ran away from the shop to join the circus, and the story became more adventure-oriented and followed a continuous serial storyline. Tubbs would go on increasingly exciting adventures until, in May of 1929, he met Captain Easy on a treasure hunt. By the early 1930s, Captain Easy would take over as the strip's main character. The first adventure strips that launched as adventure strips appeared in two different newspapers, but on the same day, January 7, 1929. Both were inspired by pulp novels and adventure serial films. Tarzan, adapted from Edgar Rice Burroughs' novels and drawn by Hal Foster, and Buck Rogers' 2429 AD, created by Philip Francis Nowlin, but written and drawn for the newspapers by Richard Culkin. The Tarzan strip is much wordier, as you can see, but with Foster and later Bern Hogarth's lush illustrations, it was easy to forgive the heavy captions. Buck Rogers was more comic-y and delivered classic space opera adventure. The success of strips like Wash Tubs, Tarzan, and Buck Rogers inspired a slew of new adventure strips. For example, Chester Gold's Dick Tracy, which debuted in 1931. Gold would draw the strip himself until 1977, but it's still in syndication today. Tracy was known for his cool gadgets. He was a sort of Bond before Bond. Gould also created a fascinating rogues gallery of bizarre and highly caricatured villains, but he was also known for his willingness to use violence in the strip and even have Tracy kill his antagonists, so many of those villains only appeared once. Debuting in January of 1934, Flash Gordon was essentially a Buck Rogers ripoff, but it had something Buck Rogers didn't. Alex Raymond. Raymond drew the strip until he was drafted into the military in 1944, and many folks, myself included, think he may be one of the finest American cartoon illustrators. And that elevates Flash Gordon well above its knockoff status. Oh, and the movie based on the series has one of the greatest theme songs of all time. Flash! Debuting in October of 1934, Milt Kniff's Terry and the Pirates is probably the most popular of the adventure strips at the time. Kniff's action-oriented but elegant visual storytelling was hugely influential on both his peers and generations of artists to follow. The strip followed the adventures of the titular Terry and his adventuring journalist friend the strapping Pat Ryan in the South China Seas. The strip can be troublesome for modern readers due to its stereotypical, orientalist, even racist depictions of Chinese people. However, it did include some complex, if still really problematic, depictions of powerful women, like the really interesting character Sanjak, who was a sympathetic lesbian spy in the 1930s. The Phantom, written by Lee Falk and drawn by Roy Moore, debuted in February 1936. Meeting out justice in a costume, but without powers, the Phantom is an important precursor to the superhero story. The Phantom was perhaps more popular abroad than in the US, and remains particularly popular in Australia and India. In fact, one apocryphal story tells us that when Germany occupied Norway in World War II, they tried to demoralize the populace by printing stories in the newspapers about the destruction and defeat of the USA. But what the Germans didn't realize was that those same newspapers were still printing Phantom strips. The Norwegians, who were big enough fans that Phantom was a password for the resistance movement, knew that the strips were produced in the U.S., and thus that the Nazis were lying. While all this was going on, well, not the World War II stuff, which was later, a new medium was being created. 
the comic book. As we've been discussing for the past few videos, newspaper comics were big business. But for most folks, if you wanted to reread your favorite strips, you had to keep old newspapers around. A handful of book-bound reprints of famous strips were produced, but they were a little pricey for your average kid with pocket change. And all of this began to change in the 1920s. In 1922, MB Publishing put out Comics Monthly, a 24-page magazine that reprinted strips from a famous series each month. So the first issue was reprints of Cliff Sterrett's Polly and Her Pals, followed by Rube Goldberg's Mike and Ike, then C.M. Payne's Smatter Pop, etc., etc. It sold for a dime and lasted 12 issues. In 1929, Dell began publishing The Funnies, a 16-page periodical that published original comic strips, likely strips rejected by major papers, and cost, depending on the issue, between an affordable 5 cents and a hefty 30 cents. The format was more like the Sunday comic supplement without the newspaper than what we think of as a comic book, though. In 1933, Maxwell Gaines produced an 8-page booklet called Funnies on Parade. It was sent as a promotional freebie with Procter & Gamble goods. This had both reprints of famous strips and some original material. There were a few other attempts around this time, like the 1933 book Detective Dan, Secret Operative Number 48. But what really changes the game is Max Gaines' second attempt. After Funnies on Parade, Gaines collaborated with the publisher Dell to produce a 36-page book, Famous Funnies, A Carnival of Comics, distributed through Woolworth's department store. And this is the first comic book as we know it. By 1934, Famous Funnies number one hits newsstands. We're not entirely sure whether a carnival of comics was sold or given away at Woolworths, but Famous Funnies number one was definitely meant for sale, and Gaines and Dell uh, settled on a 10 cents sweet spot. Remember, this is during the height of the Great Depression, and the difference between 10 cents and 20 cents was huge. Famous Funnies number one was also bumped up to 68 pages and contained reprints of famous newspaper characters, including the cover feature, Mutt and Jeff, as well as puzzles, games, and instructions for magic tricks. All that fun stuff. Its initial print run was 200000 and shockingly, it sold almost 90% of that run. However, the high printing costs were an issue for its publishers, at first. By the 12th issue, it was turning a profit as high as $30,000 per issue, which is over $540,000 in today's terms. Famous Funnies kicked off an industry. It was the first comic book on the stands, uh, and it was all reprints. But slowly and surely, books would begin incorporating more original material. Sometimes it would be knockoffs of popular strips, sometimes new hits were generated in the comic books. By February of 1935, the first comic book with all original material, New Fun Comics, hit the newsstands. Within five years, the industry exploded. In 1934, there was one comic book publisher, it produced one ongoing title, and three magazines. In 1939, there were 18 publishers, 50 ongoing titles, that produced 322 individual comic magazines. And one of the things that really helped get the industry going? A little book called Action Comics, which debuted in the spring of 1938. But we'll talk about that next time. See you then.